We're back with a bonus episode of the Corporate Gossip Podcast, somewhat timed with the finale of Succession a couple of weeks ago. We dive into the Murdoch family, the basis for that show. This episode is a little special because we have some visuals, we have some pictures that go along with it that we queue up about halfway through the episode and you can watch along on YouTube. We finally have YouTube episodes up. Guys, bear with us. We're still figuring it out, but you can follow along at the link in our show notes. And if you want to just see the pictures that we talk about, check out the link to our Substack. That's also in the show notes. You can see pictures of Rupert Murdoch's many wives. You can see Lachlan on the back of a Ducati. It's a real feast for the eyes. Now I also get to do my favorite thing, which is thank everybody who bought us a coffee since the last episode. So I have Stanley Braganza, Wilson from Van, Anastasia, Kate Green, Oscar Flores, Greg, Eddie, and Alan Lubin. Thank you so much for this episode in particular. It purchased us some Twinkies that we really needed to energize us for this early morning recording, but otherwise they pay for all the subscriptions and all the fees that are required for us to do the research for this podcast. If you want to buy us a coffee, you can do so at the link in the show notes. I hope you guys enjoy this bonus episode. In the middle of the Caribbean Sea on a January night in 2018, Jerry Hall is standing on the deck of a mega yacht, wrapping herself tightly in her cardigan, which covers her silk pajamas. Her long blonde hair is whipped mightily by the force of the medevac copter, which has just landed on the aft deck. The EMTs rush out of the aircraft and swiftly load her husband, who is strapped to a backboard. Jerry jumps in and holds his hand. At 85 years old, this could finally be the end. One of the most powerful men in the world wouldn't be fallen by a massive heart attack or a counter-ops assassination attempt. No, Jerry worried, cause of Rupert Murdoch's death? A stumble down a short flight of stairs on his way to take a piss. Murdoch's adult children, Prudence, Elizabeth, Lachlan, and James, rush to his bedside to say their final goodbyes. At the UCLA Medical Center, they temporarily put aside their sibling conflicts and simmering tensions over who would control their father's media empire. For now, they'd rally around the man who was the narcissistic, emotionally withholding son around which each of them orbited. In a sense, there would be relief when he was gone. Lately, it seemed their father's sole motivation was to pit each of them against one another like toy soldiers, manipulating them financially and emotionally to turn on their own kin. Finally, the Murdoch siblings saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, oh, stay away from me, Roger Ailes! Oh, wait, oh my God, am I alive? And just like that, the Murdoch family dynamics were restored. Lachlan was relieved. The oldest son and Rupert's golden child, Lachlan was only recently brought back into the family fold to run 21st Century Fox. A decade earlier, he had quit the family business, frustrated with his father's unrelenting control over his every move. Rupert was stung, but finally got Lachlan to return after failing to strike out on his own. Lachlan knew he needed the cover his father provided to protect him from his adversaries, including his biggest threat, his younger brother, James. James was downcast. He was beaten down after decades of being his father's patsy despite his unwavering dedication. While his older brother had spent the last decade partying and playing boss boy, James was making his bones in the big leagues, climbing the ranks judiciously and ceding to his father's every whim, culminating in a stunning betrayal when Rupert threw James under the bus blaming him for a corporate scandal he had nothing to do with. Now, James was exacting revenge. After his father's demise, he planned to wrest control of the company from his brother with the help of his sisters. Elizabeth was conflicted. She was never in contention to lead the family dynasty, though many would remark that she was the smartest and most capable of the clan. Rupert's old school mentality would never allow a woman to take control. Despite that, she couldn't escape her familial destiny, dedicating her life to proving herself to dad and crossing her siblings to please him. And Prudence? Wait, where'd Prudence go? 
The basis for the show Succession, the real Murdoch family story, is even more batshit than the HBO version. Scandals, cover-ups, family therapy sessions gone awry, the similarities are so stunning that the real-life siblings have accused one another of leaking storylines to the Succession writer's room. You be the judge for yourself. Is truth more scandalous than fiction? This is the Corporate Gossip Podcast, The Murdoch's Schmuck Session. Welcome back to a special bonus episode of the Corporate Gossip Podcast here at Skilling Studios. <laughs> Sk- Skilling <laughs> We're Studios. here at the crack of dawn. We have our Jeff Skilling breakfast, Twinkies, and some Diet Coke. We're ready to bring you this episode about the Rupert Murdoch clan, which is the basis for the show of Succession, which just ended a couple weeks ago. We meant to get this out earlier, but Adam came down with a nasty case of Colombian COVID. Colombian, South American COVID. <laughs> so we, uh, we're, we're, we're here when we're here, all right? And if you've been waiting for some Succession juiciness, we have arrived finally. Obviously, there's going to be some succession spoilers in this episode, in part because there's just a crazy number of similarities between real life and the fictionalized account. We have done a ton of research, obviously, for this episode, and we wanted to shout out some incredible reporting done by Vanity Fair, Sarah Ellison, Jonathan Maller, and Tim Bruttenberg of The New York Times, in addition to a really good documentary on BBC called The Murdoch Dynasty, or as they call it, the Murdoch Dynasty. Are you ready to get into it? Yeah, let's dive in. Let's dive in. So, meet Rupert Murdoch. And at the end of this piece of corporate gossip, Mike and Adam, I want you to tell me who you'd bed, wed, and behead. Can they be all the same person? Well, we'll see. (laughs) Rupert Murdoch, Ronald Reagan, and Jack Welsh. Okay? So, let's meet Murdoch. So he's born on March 11th, 1931 in Melbourne, Australia to Keith Murdoch, who was a regional newspaper magnate. He's got three sisters. He's his parents' only son and he's the heir to his father's company. So Keith Murdoch, his father, had several newspapers in Australia and Adelaide. And the interesting part here is there is no real inter-sibling drama for Rupert. Most of the drama in his life, sorry, drama, in his life is between him and his dad, who is a megalomania, a megalomania, <laughs> a megalomaniacal racist who really sets the stage for his descendants. It's interesting to hear the things that people say about Rupert's dad when he was building his small empire of newspapers in Australia. One Australian newspaper said he's creating a press dictatorship for all Australia with Murdoch-inspired leaders and Murdoch-trained reporters. He's also a member of the Eugenic Society in Victoria, and in an editorial once wrote that the great question facing Britain was, will she, if she needs be, fight for a white Australia? Will she, if need be, fight for a white Australia? Yeah. So Keith also had a special skill that he taught his son before he died of cancer when Rupert is 21. Not fly fishing. It's using media holdings to extract extract favors from politicians. Wow. You see, Rupert, you must (laughs) catch them with hookers. That's the golden (laughs) ticket. Like, imagine the conversations around the dinner table as Rupert is growing up. Rupert... His dad dies, I mean, pretty suddenly. His dad's only in his 50s when he dies. And Rupert, I think, was at college at the time, but had to come back. And he's gaining control of part of the family business at 21. One portion. So Rupert is left not the entire keys to the kingdom. Much of the business had to be sold off to pay taxes. He's left News Limited. So he starts with News Limited and then kind of builds out an empire. Right. So he's got his newspaper, and what do you think? At this point, he probably keeps a low profile, addresses the trauma of his father's untimely death, and spends time really developing his own unique vision for the burgeoning media business. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, that's exactly, that That would be what I would do. Right. I, right into therapy, uh, pr- probably a retreat upstate. <laughs> <laughs> no. Rupert goes, oh, you think my daddy was a racist, power-hungry cockswinger? Watch this. 
mother effers. And he employs the classic rich kid business strategy, do what your daddy did, but bigger and dirtier. That's what they don't teach you in college, my friends. So let's learn the Rupert Murdoch playbook. So first, he expands in Australia. He's buying and building massive news conglomerates. He takes control eventually of two thirds of the national newspaper market. And he uses the platform to help politicians that pledge to reduce media regulation. So he's basically trading favors with politicians, right? Then he moves to the UK where he's buying newspapers like the News of the World and The Sun, along with The Times and part of B Sky B, which is British Sky Broadcasting. It's if you if you go to the UK, that's like the CNN there. He's promoting politicians like Margaret Thatcher, who wouldn't refer his rapid media expansion to anti-monopoly regulators. So the same exact playbook. He becomes a kingmaker in the UK. The middle episode of that BBC documentary is literally called Kingmaker. He's the one who more or less ends up deciding elections and politicians have no choice but to court him. And like, imagine some, it, remember, he's from Australia. He's not even from the UK. So he goes to another country and immediately tries to influence elections. Kind of sounds like Elon. Um, he turned the sun into a tabloid and he told the new editor, I want, <laughs> I want a tear away paper with lots of tits in it. <laughs> More tits and ass. More tits. More tits and arse. Arse. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, so it's interesting, this playbook, playbook that he has of, like, collecting media assets. It's always, like, tabloids. Media assets. Media asses. It's, it's uh, always... You know what they call boobs in Australia, what? a slang? Bazoombas. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have a ton of bazoombas. <laughs> What'd you say? Wabos. <laughs> <laughs> so the Rupert Murdoch playbook for, for our for collecting media assets and gaining influence, power, and control is first you buy a tabloid. So think of this as like the news and the inquire. That's where you get a real control of the public. Then you go into like a real hard hitting newspaper. Yeah. So maybe like the wall street journal or the Australian or the Australian. Then you go into television because then you get the minds of yes. the people live. So how is that possible? How is it possible for you to buy it seems like most people would say, like, it's not good for one person to be controlling the tabloids, the gossip rags, the newspapers, and television. How did that happen? Well, 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 folks, the mighty villain of the Corporate Gossip Podcast comes swinging his wabos. Reagan shows up again. Lastly, the U.S. He shows up on uh, U.S. soil, and he buys the New York Post in 1976 to promote... Ronald Reagan, who then, what are the chances, waived a prohibition against owning a TV station and a newspaper in the same market. The Reagan administration also, coincidentally, eliminated something called the Fairness Doctrine, which required broadcasters to present both sides of any major public policy debate, which is crazy that that was even a, a law. I mean, Fox News could never exist. A lot of these, you know, media outlets couldn't exist. Basically, this paved the way for more radical views, including bombastic right-wing personalities who were able to spread their opinion to a growing audience of conservatives who didn't trust this mainstream media. Does that sound familiar? This is kind of what plays out in the third season of Succession, where Logan Roy basically picks the GOP presidential c candidate, which is kind of interesting. So as a boss, Rupert is very similar to Logan Roy. He really does rule with an iron fist. He's constantly pitting people against one another. This is from a memoir called Full Disclosure by Andrew Neal. He says, when you work for Rupert Murdoch, you don't work for a company chairman or a chief executive. You work for a son king. You are not a director or a manager or an editor. You are courtier at the court of the son king. He may intervene in matters great or small. You never know when or where, which is what keeps you on your toes, and the king is constantly on your mind. I wonder how the king is today is the first question that springs to a good courtier's mind when he wakes up every day. Okay, so bed, wed, behead. Reagan, Murdoch, Welsh. I think I would like to bed 
Murdoch, Wed Welch, and Behead Reagan. Oof. Mike, what do you think? Bed Reagan. Bed Reagan? But yeah, I mean, that guy's got experience. Yeah. He was and a famous actor and the president. I mean, objectively, the he's, hotter he's, of the It's going to be the best lay. <laughs> Wed Murdoch, because that divorce parachute is going to be great. Mm. And then Murder Welsh. Just because I just because the other two make the most sense, so he's got to take the fall. Yeah, I would. Unfortunately, if you guys saw my Smasher Pass TikTok, I did say that Reagan was objectively, unfortunately, Smash. So, bad Reagan. Yeah, same with Mike. Bad Reagan, behead Welsh, and <laughs> when we're talking. Can I hear you say I agree with Mike? <laughs> I agree with Mike. Wow, okay. you heard it here, folks. So. You ready for the next piece of corporate gossip? Yes. That was a good analysis. Move over, Jordan from Summer House. That's a deep cut. Rupert Murdoch is New York City's most eligible bachelor. By the way, <laughs> a lot of people are like, oh, I don't I don't really get the Bravo references. Someone was like, can you um, can you reference the challenge more? And I was like, well, I've never watched the challenge. And then I remembered that we actually watched it in its entirety. Right. <laughs> I forgot. You never really watched it except for we obsessively watched it for six months straight. Yeah. Well, that's in a different part of my brain, I guess. That's not as easily accessible. Move over Johnny Bananas. Sure. No, I think it would actually be Jordan from The Challenge. He's like the most eligible uh, bachelor, too. Jordan from The Challenge. Yeah. What about, but who, he's just not always hinges love it. most. Kenny and CT. Yeah. All of those people. Uh, all of those guys. Okay. Are you, ha are you guys happy now? So... The most eligible bachelor. Rupert Murdoch is 92 years old. He's had five wives. He basically, <laughs> he's living his own version of Love Island where every decade or so, a hot new bombshell enters the villa. <laughs> we have move a proper over, chat. Move over, Patricia. <laughs> he comes in. <laughs> can, we, can you do that as we go through? All right, so his first wife is Patricia Booker. They're married in 1956 when Rupert is 25 and Patricia is 28. She's a flight attendant from Melbourne. Melbourne. They have one child together, Prudence Murdoch, two years later, and they divor divorce in 1967. Now, Prudence, if you go to any of the other documentaries about Rupert Murdoch, she's never going to show up anywhere. She truly is. Like, they weren't kidding. When Colin is kind of so for forgettable on Succession, that So really forgettable that his name's Connor. <laughs> <laughs> Connor. Colin is, I think, the bodyguard. But, yeah, Connor. In the, uh, Did you notice in that BBC documentary when they kept showing the family tree? Prudence wasn't even on it. It was just Elizabeth James and Lachlan. So, mm -hmm. yeah, she's you unfortunately... Know what you say, the the family that you create with your first wife doesn't really count. Oh, is that what they say? Yeah. <laughs> in Australia. Yeah, yeah. It's a, a common phrase in Adelaide. So after the divorce, Patricia married a bad news Swiss banker and started hard partying and kind of neglected Prudence. I think Prudence has kind of a, a sad life. So Prudence at nine persuades her dad to take full custody of her. Can you imagine going to your dad and saying, please, like, take care of me. And she ended up with a pretty poor relationship with her own mom and Rupert's next wife, Anna Torv. So Anna Torv is kind of the Caroline character on Succession, although unlike Caroline... The mother. The mother. I, I, unlike Caroline, it seems for all intents and purposes, Anna Torv is a good mom, unlike Caroline. So the next year, he's married to Anna. Torv is 23 and Murdoch is 36. And you'll see <laughs> he keeps getting older and his wives stay about the same age. So at the time, she was working for his Sydney newspaper, The Daily, Mar the Daily Mirror. They're married for 32 years. They have three children and we'll get to them shortly at length. But they have this huge divorce in 1998 because... Nobody was expecting it. Everybody thought that Rupert and Anna were in a good place. And of course, there's this nasty legal fight over the Murdoch fortune. 
And Anna says something pretty devastating after the divorce. She says, I began to think the Rupert Murdoch that I had loved died a long time ago. Perhaps I was in love with the idea of still being in love with him, but the Rupert I fell in love with could not have behaved this way. She said during their breakup, he was extremely hard, ruthless, and determined. One of the reasons why he might have been so hasty to divorce her and give her an over billion dollars in the marriage settlement is that 17 days after his divorce is inked with Anna, he is married to a woman named Wendy Dang, or as the Vanity Fair calls her, Wendy Dang. <laughs> <laughs> so he marries her on a yacht in, I think, the New York Harbor. Um, I, yeah, they had video. Yeah, there was the a video on the documentary. If you're watching on YouTube, we just put up some pictures. We're going to be um, visually representing the rest of our story. I forgot to put it up earlier. So here we are. All right. So here's Wendy Dang and Rupert Murdoch on their wedding day in the New York Harbor. I think that's the Statue of Liberty behind them. Yeah, that looks them. like the Statue of Liberty, right? Happy day. So she's 30. He is... How old oh. does he look? He's only 68, although he looks that looks, 80s. Six, that looks 68. Yeah. So they're married for four, 14 years. Allegedly, she treated Rupert terribly. She called him old and stupid. And did you notice <laughs> in that BBC documentary one day when this after this picture is taken, suddenly his hair is like mahogany. <laughs> He's like jet black. Yeah. That was her doing. She told him, you got to dye your hair. And it's like, this man does not have brown hair. (laughs) So James and Lachlan, even though at the time they weren't necessarily seeing eye to eye, they both hated her. Oh, it's so funny watching the interviews with uh, Elizabeth. And she's like, she's like, she's like, yeah, I guess like you fall in love. And um yeah, we're just going to see where it goes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's, and like, she's just like trying to put on a real trooper of a face and be like, this is never going to last. Yes. I think that Wendy Dang is supposed to be, I'm not sure who Marsha is supposed to be in succession. It's some combination I think it's of an amalgamation yes, of, of women. Of Wendy Dang and his next wife. James and Lachlan sat their dad down before they got married and told him, not to marry her because they thought she was a Chinese intelligent asset. (laughs) (laughs) So they end up having two daughters in 2001 and 2003. So one of their daughter's godparents was Tony Blair. And there's all these rumors circulating towards the end of this marriage that Wendy Dang is having an affair with Tony Blair. That's the UK prime but she minister. Had, she had like these love letters right. for Tony Blair, like his legs, oh, <laughs> these beautiful legs. She goes, yeah, I don't have the letter in front of me, but it's something like, oh, how do I miss Tony? His piercing blue eyes, his lovely hair. Like, and, and it's so like his legs, oh, his legs are, they're legs. <laughs> So the thing you have to realize about Tony Blair is this isn't just like some hot guy that Wendy had encountered. This is one of Rupert Murdoch's best friends. Remember in the UK, he's he's the kingmaker still. So he had done a lot of favors for Tony Blair and in return, Tony Blair had done many favors for him. There's stories though about Wendy Dang where she has a girl's weekend, quote unquote, up in Carmel where they had a summer house. And (laughs) apparently she had asked Tony to come with her and Rupert. Come on over. We're going to have dinner. And then he shows up and he's like, where's Rupert? And she's like, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Rupert ends up cornering all the staff that work at the house and was like, has Tony Blair been here (laughs) fucking my wife? (laughs) Anyway. He's obviously really hurt by this. There's also rumors that she was sleeping with Google chairman Eric Schmidt at the time as well. Eventually, Wendy hires William Zabel. Remember him? No. He was the one who represented Jane Welsh in their divorce settlement. Oh, man. The the queen maker, yeah. William Zabel. Yeah, to represent her in the divorce. Um, she got $100 million in the divorce settlement. So She seems like she probably could have gotten more. I know. $100 million did seem yeah. low, considered. But I think he must have not been as motivated because with Anna Torv, he was just like, oh, well, get her out of here. I'm excited to marry Wendy Dang. And he didn't That's have true. anybody lined up. So she didn't he was have any leverage. Motivated. Yeah. So that summer, 
In true summer house fashion, Rupert goes out to the Hamptons with all of his friends and his, quote, hurt feelings have been soothed by a new romantic interest, a younger woman who's been traveling with him, his massage therapist, who he told friends has made him very happy, <laughs> says his one time biographer, Michael Wolf. But, you know, we've all had a summer fling. Then he marries Jerry Hall. Had you ever heard of Jerry Hall? Can you go to the next image, Mike? So this is Jerry Hall at their wedding. She's really pretty. She's a former model married at one time to Mick Jagger. She is There's Rupert looking like a thumb. <laughs> I, I started calling him in my head Rumu. <laughs> so there is Rumu and Jerry on their wedding day in 2016. He's fif she's 59. He's 85. At the time, <laughs> she looks like she's got her winning lottery ticket in her hand. <laughs> By all, I mean, she seems like a nice person. Like, as far as we can tell, I, I didn't find anything. I mean, she's got Mick Jagger money, so I'm sure she does fine. Right. He's over the moon. If you go to his Twitter account right now, Rupert Murdoch, this day is the last time he ever tweeted. He goes, no more tweets for 10 days or ever. Feel like the luckiest and happiest man in the world. How sweet is that? Very sweet. But eventually things get a little dicey for Jerry and Rumu because he starts becoming very close with Trump and the and the Trump circle. And she's she's like pretty outspokenly not like anti-conservative. And she'll go up to people on their yacht and be like, you know, either whether it's Trump or whether it's his people and, and you know, pick fights with them. And he wasn't like thrilled about that. In 2022. And this is amid concerns of Rupert's declining health. She was on the yacht with him when he fell in 2018, um, which, by the way, looked a lot like the pilot episode of Succession. Rupert abruptly files from divorce from Jerry Hall. She was not expecting it at all. She's at their estate in Oxfordshire waiting for him to meet her when she gets divorced via email. Rupert sends an email that says, Jerry, Sadly, I've decided to call an end to our marriage. We have certainly had some good times, but I have much to do. My New York lawyer will be contacting yours immediately. Two months later, divorce is finalized. She gets the Oxfordshire house and as part of the divorce settlement had agreed not to give plot lines to the writers of succession. And while she's moving in... It's a pretty typical... It's a boilerplate divorce agreement. Right, right. Absolutely. While she's moving into the house, she finds surveillance cameras that were installed. And actually, Mick Jagger's security team came in to remove them. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> that is actually really nice. Yeah. So, I mean, gosh, like you marry a guy for his money and then this happens. <laughs> so now. <laughs> you couldn't get a, a clearer picture. <laughs> This, no, the, there's not many. It's not pictures. a good light. Oh my gosh. There's not many pictures that exist with Rupert and his next fiance because they weren't together for very long. They are engaged in April 2023, and they break off the engagement. I mean, this was what two months ago. <laughs> they break off the en engagement shortly after. She's 66. He's 92. She's a former radio host who had been invited as as Rupert over the past couple of years is becoming closer and closer with Trump, she's starting to get into their circle. At one point, and Jerry Hall met her, at one point she goes up to Rupert and is like, you are saving democracy with what you're doing with Fox News. Like, I'm so happy, you know, this is happening, right? She's big into Christian nationalism and right-wing conspiracy theories. And two weeks after announcing their engagement, Rupert called it off, allegedly because he was getting skeeved out by her radical views. She said that Tucker Carlson is a messenger from God. <laughs> and you know what's so crazy about this is it's like, you know, we'll get into the Fox of it all, but he's so turned off by her, but it's like, this is Fox News base. And it reminded me of like on January 6th when there were reports of Trump being like, wait, why do these rioters why do these so people scumbag? look like shit? Yeah, it's just like, this is what you've done. What? You have created this. <laughs> I thought I thought my base came from the Louis Vuitton fashion yeah, show. Yeah, what no. the hell? I thought these were Charleston elite. Yeah. <laughs> and, 
it's just like, oh my god. So who's gonna be wife number six? Okay, I've got, I, okay I've got some guesses. All right, so I've got two really, three really good guesses. So I've got Luann de Lesseps, former housewife and royalty. Yeah, she's not age appropriate, but she's totally looking for a suitor with money. Absolutely, and she's a countess. Yeah, Susan Sarandon, who's actually age appropriate. I would I would think better of Susan Sarandon than to be caught dead with Rumu. Okay, so that's what I thought, and then I said Sharon Stone because she's she's a little bit off the deep end, mm-hmm. and she she would she would probably work well. And then I've got <laughs> Meg the Stallion, <laughs> just like way out there, or Pete Davidson. Yeah, I mean it has to be Erica Jane. Oh well, she's already with somebody else. So what about, what about, what about the ultimate homewrecker? Sheena Shea. Oh, no. Sheena, Sheena Shea. Shea's happily yeah, Sheena married. Shea's happy. That ain't going to last. Raquel. 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 But I could totally see Erica Jane being like, Rupert followed a yacht. <laughs> <laughs> and his son, his his son, his son it rolled was his snow, car. It was snowing in the ocean. Yeah. and It was a switchback. It was a switchback. You, you know, know what I mean by that? Was to co- <laughs> the boat was on a switchback. switchback. <laughs> the boat toppled over. <laughs> All right. Do you think we should take a break? Yeah, let's take a break. <laughs> this is a good, good as time as any. All right. We're going to take a break and we'll be back and introduce you to the Murdoch kids. All right. We're back. So the next piece of corporate gossip is, in my head, the Murdoch kids battle for the top spot at News Corp is less like an Emmy Award winning HBO series and more like that scene in the Jersey Shore where the girls are too drunk to work a shift at the t-shirt shop and Snooki gets arrested at the beach. <laughs> a really iconic scene. I have a question. Ask what? You want a funnel beer? It's 30. You were just sick a second ago. Do you want to do anything fun? Uh, yeah, let's make a sale. I love that. It totally psychs me up. I gotta go. Nicole! Oh, God, what? Every time I try and steal a beer, Danny catches me. Nicole, where are you going now? Ah, I'm going pee! No, you're not. You're yeah. following a beer. If I want to have a beer, I'm allowed to have a beer. That's it. You're staying all night. This isn't like law school. This is a t-shirt shop. <laughs> that's Elizabeth Murdoch. <laughs> okay, so tell me that's not accurate. <laughs> All right. (laughs) So to set the next part of the story, to tell this part, we need to go back to 2017-ish. This is when the Murdoch kids are at the height of their power struggle. And Rupert had always wanted one of his kids to succeed him. So if you're looking at the picture on YouTube, I'll point out some of the kids, right? So we have Lachlan up in the corner. This is from Jerry Hall and, and Rupert's wedding. This is Prudence kind of just sticking her head out of the side of like, hey guys, what about me? Window, <laughs> yeah. window. Yeah, window. Yeah, like, you know, the window, when you're taking a picture, somebody's gotta find the window. <laughs> yeah, she's, can, that's really is Prudence. She's yeah. just like, I'm here too. <laughs> Um, then we have Elizabeth right next to Jerry Hall, James in the back, and then Chloe, and I'm not sure which one is Chloe and which one is the other one. Okay, so we have Prudence, 59 years old. We're not going to talk much about her. She's not in the mix trying to compete. She's doing her own thing. Um, (laughs) at one point, Murdoch um, was doing a speech and he referred to my three children in 1997 He had, at the time, four children. (laughs) (laughs) And she said in an interview that this sparked the biggest row I've ever had with my father. It's like, I would hope so. God. Anyway, so then we have Elizabeth Murdoch, who's 49, Lachlan Murdoch's 46, and James Murdoch's 45. We're going to get into each of those. And just like the show, Rupert really fostered a terrible family dynamic. This is a quote. Murdoch believed a Darwinian struggle would produce the most capable heir. He pitted his kids against each other their entire lives. It's sad, said a person close to the family. And it's like so funny. This just comes, this is just total generational trauma. Like, no, I'm not going to, you know, be thoughtful about their upbringing, teach them grit, teach them determination. Let's just have them fight it out. (laughs) (laughs) So let's meet Elizabeth. Okay, so here's Elizabeth. Do you recognize anyone else in the picture? It's Elizabeth, well, it's Elizabeth and Rupert. Elon and Rupert. That's yeah. at this year's Super Bowl. So Elizabeth was often considered the smartest of the Murdoch kids, but she'd never be Rupert's heir because he's sexist. She's a woman. Yeah. So despite and maybe because of her dad, she had in her own right became a 
pretty powerful person, being named at one point the UK's fifth most powerful woman by the BBC. And Rupert always told people that Elizabeth was the most like him. So he must have been like disappointed in a way, which is just when Shiv at the end in succession says like he couldn't hold a whole woman in his head. I think that is really speaking to Elizabeth's experience. She started her career as a manager at FX and then decided I wanted to strike out on my own and I wanted to be my own boss. <laughs> so what's the best way to do that, people? I don't know. We probably have some entrepreneurs listening. She probably did what you all did, right? Ask dad for a $35 million loan, <laughs> which she used to purchase a few NBC affiliate television stations in California. She stole the stations a year later and made a $12 million profit by boosting ad sales and reducing staff. It's so funny because, like, you know, she was just like, I'm a genius. I'm so smart. <laughs> Who else can do this? Me. So with a fat wallet and daddy all paid off, she wanted to go to Stanford where she got accepted to do her MBA. But dad said, no, come work for me at B Sky B. And keep in mind, she's 30 and still doing whatever daddy says, which is just like, oof, yikes. So when Elizabeth gets to be Sky B, she's working under this guy, Sam Chisholm. He's like legendary in the industry and in the company. And this is where like a theme emerges about the Murdoch kids. They cannot handle working if they're not working directly for daddy. Like they're either totally insubordinate or insufferable or they're throwing fits when they don't get special treatment. Because she immediately, she gets there in 1995 and she's like, don't you know who I am, Sam Chisholm? Like, promote me. And he doesn't. And she says, the slow pace of her ascent at Beast Sky B knocked my confidence and made me ask. What is the slow what? ascent? Like, she was three months? She's I know. like, I've been enrolled for three months. Where's my promotion? Exactly. And she asks, what am I not doing to get ahead? And the truth is, she's not being a special boy. Because at the time, her younger brothers are being elevated up in the company under her dad, and she's not. Maybe due to a combination of Chisholm, like being this larger than life guy, not putting up with the Murdoch kids. He's like confident in his own right. He doesn't. And at the time, Murdoch only owns like 39% of B Sky B. So there isn't like that pressure of the owner's daughter working for you. But either way, eventually she quits this dead end job. And she meets Matthew Freud, who's a public relations guru and the great grandson of Sigmund Freud. And it's interesting because I think once I'm not going to say like, oh, this guy just by by nature of being a psychoanalyst grandson knows about family trauma, but he probably know more than the average person. So it's really interesting because at this point she really starts to separate from the family. And I'm just totally, this is totally conjecture, but I can imagine her and this guy having, you know, a lot of deep conversations. Yeah. About I mean, she's trauma. probably never seen a therapist in her life. Maybe. I have no idea. And this guy's playing therapist. Interestingly though, when they start hooking up, she was already married to somebody else who she had met in college and he was also married and his wife was pregnant. So they had this long affair. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Eventually, even after he divorced his wife, he said he was wretched with guilt. He was an adulterer. <laughs> like, yeah, no shit. You don't need to be Freud's great grandson to predict that outcome. You fucking bozo. <laughs> They're married in 21, 2001. And Freud, as far as we can tell, is kind of a prick, quote unquote, <laughs> from his sister he had no understanding of the relationship between working hard and doing well he thought that if he could be in the right place at the right time with a bit of luck on his side then he might have a chance of getting away with it i mean he's not wrong he's a billionaire now so through marriage right but he is in the right place at the right time <laughs> So Freud is really pushing Elizabeth to strike out on her own. So finally, she leaves B Sky B and, and starts her own TV company called Shine. Freud says she knew people would wonder if she was at Sky because of her daddy. It's like, uh, wondered? <laughs> like, yeah. Right after she starts Shine, she signs a production deal with B Sky B and they take a 5% stake in her company and agree to air some of her shows. Come on. And like, you know that, again, all these things are happening. And I'm sure she's thinking, look, I'm smart. I started a production company and then right away I get a production deal. <laughs> it's like mm. they, they probably attribute that to their own tenacity right. and not to who their dad is. 
It's the, the the psychology of Nepo babies. I feel like we touched on that a little bit earlier this year in the zeitgeist, but like haven't really dug much further. But it's just like you guys are really insufferable. So eventually Shine is purchased by another company. Can you guess? Do you guys have any guesses who who bought it? Uh, Nestle? <laughs> <laughs> nope. News Corp. They buy it with 800 employees for six hundred and seventy million dollars elizabeth gets 40 percent of that she said she'd step down as ceo but still be chairwoman she does not now take a salary aren't you generous shareholders first right shareholders though were pissed because they alleged that news corp overpaid for this tiny production company there's a lawsuit filed by news corp shareholders holders asserting that the company overpaid for shine claiming rampant nepotism so you are going to pass away when i tell you what she's doing now mike are you ready for this she's founded a film training school that specifically takes in young people with no industry connections their mission is to fight nepotism in the industry so like normal people she's like norm She's, Normal people yeah. who don't have industry I love connections. It. Like, Nepotism no industry, for me. No but- <laughs> industry connections. So normal people. Right. Nepotism for me, but not for thee. And I I just find that so funny. And like to to be running an organization like that and also going to the Super Bowl with Elon and Daddy, it's just like, oh. It's like it's like uh, the same thing as hearing Jeffrey Dahmer's school for not eating people. Right. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, bud. I, aren't you the guy that eats people? Here's Lachlan on the back of a Ducati, which I always think is so funny when I when I see like billionaires on the back of something. Who is yeah. he straddling? Why is he stra- I, uh, That guy's probably like a, a racer. I he, guess. I think he is a racer. So this but is. But why like, would you want to ride, bitch? <laughs> Because I think he's just taking the photo. No, he's not. This was from a real, you can find the image. And he did like a circle with that guy. Because I, I think probably he doesn't know how to ride it. Who's that more embarrassing for? The driver or for Lachlan? <laughs> you know what's interesting about these kids is you would expect them to have like an accent. They're completely Americanized. Yeah. I would, that's when I watched the documentary, I was like, oh, I thought these, they would have accents. And they no. don't. I mean, because they were really raised in the UK and mostly America. Yeah. I mean, they live in New York, right? So yeah. Okay, so that's Lachlan. So he's the middle child, the golden child. He's described in the BBC documentary as easy and laid back, but also would like love to get into debates with his siblings in front of his dad. And you can just tell like these kids went to good school. I don't doubt that they're smart, but I don't know that they're necessarily intellectual because I feel like when they're challenged, they just kind of have a fit and then storm off. So when he's a kid in rural Australia, he worked as a jackaroo. He calls kangaroos on his family ranch with a shotgun. So he's just out there <laughs> killing kangaroos <laughs> a at a young age. He goes to Princeton and then moves back to Australia where he starts, like I said, giving strong Jeff Skilling vibes. He's walking around town in his outback boots and suits. He's rock climbing. He's dating Australian model Sandra O'Hare and riding a Kawasaki motorcycle. Like just doing all the things that a you know a normal, well-adjusted. So he knows how to ride a motorcycle, and yet he still decides <laughs> I'm gonna ride on the back with with the professional. Oh, this is on his 35th birthday. This picture. He's getting a whittle motorcycle ride. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> do, you, do you think his dad went? What do you want? What, what do you want for your birthday? <laughs> and he went, Well, Daddy. Let me explain. I want to ride a motorcycle. <laughs> Yay! Lachlan stinks. I know. This, this picture is rough. And, look. and I'm going to pretend it's you, Daddy, on the front. <laughs> driving. Us against the world. <laughs> so he becomes executive of News Corp in 1996. Um, he was always the one that Rupert wanted. I mean, really, just like Succession. I'm the eldest boy. That really is Lachlan in many senses. And people are going to ask, who is Kendall and who is Roman? And my honest assessment is they are combinations of all three children. I don't I really don't think it's one for one. But, you know, you judge for yourself and you tell me what you think. So he's chief. He's executive in News Corp in 1996. And the results of his early business ventures were mixed at best. And I would say, like, 
Oh my God. Like just because you're the kid of a billionaire guys, I mean, it just does not make you good at business. Um, sorry to tell you, but he, he got into a bad investment, a failed telecom company called OneTel, um, at the behest of his friend, another billionaire media heir, James Packer. So there we go. Two heads are <laughs> not better at business than one. James Packer. He was married to somebody. Oh, I don't know. I think he was married to, um, uh, he was married to uh, one ma- one time married to Mariah Carey. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant the yeah. Oh, really? That's yeah, so he random. Or mar- dated Mariah Carey doesn't look like he was married, but they dated for a long time. Wow. And maybe engaged. Wow. On the other hand, he's really into tech, right? So he en- invested in what ended up being Australia's biggest online real estate advertising company. Um, this was an area that Rupert was really hesitant to get into. It's like, it's giving, like, dad gets an iPad. He invested 11 million, and a few years later, it was worth 3.6 billion. So, I mean, that that was a good, much like Kendall, you know, he's into tech, he's trying to digitize, digitize his father's business. But the problem with Lachlan, like his siblings, is that he can't be managed. He's like Kanye West, that famous tweet. I fired my manager, I can't be managed. He's reporting. He also like he also gets on the back of Ducatis and says, "I think I can steal from the back." <laughs> <laughs> can I steal? <laughs> he clashed with more senior executives who saw him as quote an entitled princeling, and he's upset when his dad wouldn't sign with him in disagreements with more senior executives. When his dad's like, "No, this guy," it, it, it reminded me of Frank in succession when Frank and the other guy, if I'm blanking on his name, Carl, Carl are giving sound business advice, but Roman and Kendall <laughs> like cannot tolerate it when, when their dad sides with them. So eventually he quits, right? Cause he just can't handle it. So 10 years later in 2005, he steps down from news corp allegedly due to his father's micromanagement. He gets a hundred million dollar payout from the family trust and moves back to Australia. And at the time, I mean, everybody is pretty clear to everybody inside the company what has happened. But Mr. Murdoch told the Financial Times that they remained very close and that Lachlan's sudden departure had nothing to do with his business skills. Rupert also says, there were absolutely no tensions building between me and Lachlan. None. I begged him to stay, says Rupert. Okay. So at this point, Rupert is pissed because he feels like Lachlan doesn't want the job enough. So now it seems for a time, and eventually that will change, that Lachlan is out as heir apparent. He goes back to Australia and James steps up. So then there's James, right? James is a little different from the rest of the family. He's the black sheep. He's an undergrad at Harvard. He's on the staff of the Harvard Lampoon, which again is something that Kendall talks about. And he wanted to become a medieval historian. He ends up dropping out of college to be a deadhead. He starts a record record label called Raucous Records. I never made this connection. He produced Mostaf, Talib Kweli. The year that James would have graduated Harvard, his dad, Rupert Murdoch, ends up purchasing Raucous Records and brings him into the fold. Like, imagine you keep trying to do your own thing and your dad just lassos you like a pig in the mud. Mm -hmm. So in the year 2000, he marries his wife, a fashion marketing executive, and a part-time model from Oregon. They Oregon. met Oregon. They met on a mutual friend's yacht in Fiji, as one does. Like Jerry, James's wife was a liberal who made herself a bit of an outcast in the family. And so from 1996, he's really making his bones. He's bopping around News Corp music division, and he... Uh, much like his brother makes a series of boneheaded moves or sorry, learning moments. (laughs) This is like very early two thousands. He wanted Rupert to buy a company called Pointcast, which was a screensaver that displayed a news sticker for $450 million. The deal fell through, I think, thankfully. And two years later, the company was purchased for $7 million. (laughs) And it kind of reminds me like these, these kids just have no sense of, 
the value. I, you know how most parents say you don't have no sense of the value of a dollar. Like these yeah. kids have no sense of the value of a company. Like in the later seasons of Succession, where the kids are trying to buy PGN, and they're and Logan says, "Congratulations, you said the bigger number." Like yeah. these kids are like, "I just want to say the bigger number so I can get the company." Like yeah. there's no thinking that goes behind it. They ended up winding the the record label down after he made a series of uh, bad acquisitions. But in 2003, he becomes CEO of B Sky B, and obviously shareholders are pissed because he's 31 years old. Yeah, in the interviews when they're like, "Oh, like, can you talk about strategy?" He's like, "Uh, yeah, I'll talk to you guys later about it. Obviously, I can't talk about it now, but <laughs> we'll t- we'll chat later." All I right? want to say that to my boss when they when they ask me something I'm not prepared to answer. I'm like, "Obviously, I can't talk about that." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's just like, let me just go have a powwow with my dad. He'll tell me what to say, and then I'll tell you guys. Yeah. So at the time, he's the youngest CEO in the FTSE 100. That's uh, like FTSE. FTSE. Pronounced. That's the equivalent of like the Forbes 100, right? He's too young. He's too inexperienced. There's charges of nepotism, blah, 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 blah. They That's just the same the name of the game that James likes to play when he's on the back. It's <laughs> FTSE. <laughs> no, the FTSE 500, the FTSE 100 is not four. It's like, um, it's, it's like, like the, the Dow. Dow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> when we get up to 100 miles per hour, we play FTSE. <laughs> we play FTSE. I get a hundred of my my friends, and we all touch feet. <laughs> <laughs> it's my party every year for my birthday. FTSE 100. We all hold feet like we're holding hands. Toes locked. We all toes toes. interlocked. <laughs> it, but it's okay because we're on a yacht. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, but regardless of his inexperience, his his age, up, up, up he goes. In 2007, he's in charge of News Corp Europe and Asia, including a company called News International, which owned a little newspaper called News of the World. Are you ready for the next piece of corporate gossip? Yes. <laughs> so what you're seeing on, on the screen right now is James and Rupert in a not so good time. The next piece of corporate gossip is news of the world phone hacking scandal. The Murdochs fucked around and found out. So in succession, (laughs) what we're about to describe is the cruise line scandal in which the Roys are exposed for covering up years of like. See, I disagree. I actually feel like the cruise line scandal is the Roger Ailes uh, scandal. I this mean, there's, what I think. there's scandal, a scandal. whatever. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> sexual assault to sexual assault, it lines up better. Yes. I think it's probably, like many things, a combination yeah. of things. But here's the here is the interesting part. In the show, Logan sets up, tries to set somebody up to take the fall. Uh, you know, will it be Kendall? Will it be Tom? You know, there's that famous scene on the yacht where they're trying to figure out who's going to take the fall because it sure ain't going to be me, <laughs> says Rupert. But here's what really happened. News of the World, which was like the most preeminent tabloid rag in London. I mean, this is like the New York Post, the Daily Mail, the Guardian, anyone Yeah, I mean, wait those. till you read this headline. It's amazing. Yeah. You'll see why. So... There's many scandals at News of the World. This, What I'm going to describe is by far not the first scandal. And there's one famous one where they call out the CEO of Formula One, Max Mosley, a married father, for having, quote, Nazi hooker orgies. <laughs> and he, and Mosley comes out and is like, guys, that's insane. The hookers were not Nazis. <laughs> I love it. He's like, he's like, listen. They were very nice women. <laughs> he actually said that. He was like, the women were very nice. There's no reason to drag their names to the mud. <laughs> Which is like, he sues News of the World for defamation. And he won. And, and guys, it's it's really hard to win a suit for defamation. And it, this is kind of uh, interestingly foreshadowing for what's about to happen in the most recent years with News Corp. But his story is funny, but it's also sad. Um, the attention that it brought on his family, it tragically led to his son's overdose and death. He will kind of have it out for Murdoch and be waiting to exact revenge on him. And we're going to see he's going to have his opportunity to do so. So there's a much, much bigger scandal that's brewing at News of the World. In the 1990s and 2000s, investigations revealed that News of the World was systematically hacking cell phones to get the inside scoop for stories. So at first, I didn't really understand how they did this. I'm like, it's the 1990s. Everything's analog. How do you hack a cell phone? 
And do you do you have any idea how they did no. this? So what they would do is I don't know if you remember, but in old cell phones, how you would access your voicemail is you would call yourself and then you would put your pin in and then it would read you your voicemails. They would basically call cell phone numbers of famous people, wait for them to not pick up and then just guess the pin. So they'd put like one, two, three, four or their birthday or zero, 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 zero. And they'd get in to the phone so they could listen to voicemails. So they could see like, for example, like a more innocuous way would be like Hugh Grant. You know, it would be a voicemail from his manager being like, hey, I know you're gonna be yeah, yeah, at, yeah. in this place at this time. And so Hugh Grant would go somewhere and there would be the paparazzi from the news of the world. And he'd be like, how the hell did you know I was gonna be there? It's because he, they were hacking his phone, right? So they hacked phones of celebrities like Hugh Graham, but they also hacked Prince Williams, Prince Harry's. And what really sent this story over the edge was they hacked the phone of a murdered 13 year old girl to try out to try to find what might have happened to her in days after her death. So she was basically missing. Her parents kept trying to call her cell phone and it would say this voice mailbox is full. And then all of a sudden, because the news of the world had hacked her cell phone and deleted one of the voicemails so they could listen to it, um, they called her phone and there was space for voicemail suddenly. And they thought, oh, she's alive. Mm. Terrible. Terrible. Really bad. Yeah. Really bad. And so when the news came out about this, it was just pandemonium for news of the world. This was a huge public outcry. This is not a normal thing for any news outlet to do. I mean, you can get a scoop, but there's something different here, right? So for the first time, practically, the Murdochs have to face consequences and immediately, immediately, Rupert throws his kid under the bus. Tons of people are suing Rupert Murdoch at this time for damages, celebrities and politicians, but also regular people. Their legal fees are being written, underwritten by Max Mosley, the Formula One CEO who was wronged by Rupert Murdoch. So Max Mosley is is essentially like, you know, if, you, if, if somebody comes to me and says, you know, I'm really not sure if I want to bring suit. He's like, I promise you, if you bring suit, you will win. And if you don't, I'll pay for everything. And essentially what he did was he had, you know, money set aside for a son who oh, yeah. tragically died. And he was just like, this is my son's legacy and this is what I'm going to pay for. So he's like, I'm bringing down the the Murdochs and my son's memory. Yeah, I, it's it's pretty incredible story. And all of these cases were settled out of court for millions. Also, just like huge shout out to Max Mosley for I being know. like, yeah, I had an orgy. <laughs> Why'd you bring the hookers into it? Like, I was like, I had to go back and watch that part of the documentary. I was like, wait, so he's just admitting to it. And then the other funny part is like, he's like, he told his wife, and, yeah. and she, and she's like, oh, honey, you just had this printed up as like a joke. And she's like, he's like, no, it's plastered all over like the UK. And she's like, oh gosh, how are we gonna deal with this? And I know. Don't even care. No, I mean it's crazy. It's like, and the funny part is, it's like, what CEO? Ha what? I mean, he's he's among good company. There's many CEOs that have had orgies with hookers. It's like, it's just like, guys, this is like pretty You normal. got me. <laughs> so Rupert and James are called to testify in front of Parliament. And this is what you're seeing right now, right? <laughs> this is, again, similar to what we see in succession. Rupert Murdoch is... <laughs> is struggling to answer a lot of questions and he keeps saying, well, James would more know more than I would. And James is a combination of like fucking Cousin Greg and Tom yes, at this point. Yes, yes. Completely an idiot. And Rupert goes into whittle baby mode. This is like classic. Elon just used the same defense, whittle baby defense. He goes, he's confused. There's parts where he's just kind of, did you watch part of this where he's just like, he can't really answer the question. He's just like kind of like old and dawdling. Yeah, they said it was like a strategy for him to be like, oh, I'm old and like, yeah. Pity me. Yeah. This is the same time as he's being described as the Sun King. So everybody who's watching this, everybody who's been victimized by this guy knows. And, you know, he's just like, I'm so old. I don't even know what's going on. So eventually James takes the fall, even though a lot of this happened before he had even taken over. And what's fucked up is Elizabeth allegedly convinced her dad to have James take the fall. That conniving bitch. Classic Shiv, huh? So James announced that the paper would close in 2011. I mean, many people were, were laid off. Upon the announcement, James Murdoch conceded that the paper was sullied by, well, this is an American accent, sullied by behavior that was wrong. If recent allegations are true, it was inhumane and has no place in our company. Side eye, side eye. 
I mean, they throw so many employees under the bus. There are a lot of Tom Wamsgans, t- Cousin Greg characters, like total fall guys. I mean, he has to resign. There's tons of arrests. Uh, a lot of the News of the World editors. Well, Tony ex- Blair's PR person who was part of the News of the World, he had to resign. Yeah. I or, mean, sorry, David Cameron. I, uh, it was David, David Cameron. Cameron's PR he guy. Go, a lot of people go to prison. Uh, for a time, James is facing criminal prosecution in the U.S., and the UK, but ultimately charges are dropped again. This, this is why I think it's very similar to the carnival, um, the cruise scandal in mm. succession. So internally, this throws the family and Rupert into turmoil. A close associate said at the time, this has all kinds of implications, the relationship with his kids, the relationship with his board. Even for someone as non-introspective as Rupert, he has to be wondering what the hell hit him. (laughs) I mean, I don't know. According to this, he's just like completely out of it. But fun fact, George Clooney had made plans to make a film about the phone hacking scandal, but had to scrap it because no investor wanted to give him money because of fear of consequences. Yes, we must upsetting. wait until Rupert dies yeah. to make the film. Of upsetting Rupert Murdoch, which is crazy. All the, well, they don't own, do they still, yeah, they don't own 21st Century Fox anymore. Uh, no, they sold it to Disney, but yeah. it doesn't matter. I mean, Rupert still has tons of power on, in the companies that he owns and, and the companies he doesn't. Are you ready to take another break? Yeah, let's take a break. All right. All right. And we're back. Adam, did you know we have something in common with the Murdochs? Ooh, tell me. Blow ups at family therapy. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's piece of corporate gossip number five. So, Adam, I'm curious. If you had to pick at this point, who would you pick to be Rupert's successor? We have James, who's just suffered from the phone hacking scandal. Lachlan is Australia trying to lick his wounds after his ill-fated attempts at being a business boy and he got shit canned from News Corp. And Elizabeth is a chick. I would pick Lachlan because I think he has the most uh, experience. And I think it's about experience. Elizabeth doesn't really have a ton of experience and she's a chick. And James (laughs) just kind of sucks. I would pick James. I feel like dealing with a phone hacking scandal like that, I mean... I don't know. If, yeah, but if, if he knew about it. He didn't. He had no control. I mean, I, he really was the fall guy. It was exactly like it happened. Okay. So I'd pick James, but I mean, public confidence in him is shaken, right? So this question is on the top of mind for the Mur- Murdoch clan. Rupert had never really made it clear who would be his successor. James and Lachlan kind of went back and forth and Rupert purposefully kept things murky interestingly like we saw this in some of the other stories that we did like this reminded me of the Fred DeLuca and the subway story because he didn't create a succession plan because he was a control freak who thinks he'll never die and there's reports that they attended several family therapy sessions to address the matter like what we saw in succession I don't know why we just can't like hey let's do succession with like people who actually deserve to have the job you know (laughs) <laughs> but who could be people. who could be more qualified than my children? I don't know I, I like to think that money and power like you still have a ton way more power than anyone else even if you're not running a media company I know but remember these guys like Welsh right you have to put it put think about the psychology of Welsh this isn't just a company this is an extension of myself so why would I give part of me to somebody who's not also part of me mm. So it's 2015, three years after the phone hacking scandal, and Rupert has two sons that are mad at him, right? Lachlan is annoyed that dad didn't trust him with the big boy job back in 2005, and James is fuming for falling on his sword over the the scandal. And so the one thing that will prevent these brothers from a massive temper tantrum is biting the bullet and finally letting them take a cookie from the cookie jar, but you two have to share. Okay, so Rupert proposed Lachlan is going to be CEO and chairman of News Corp and James would report to him. And James is livid. He feels like he earned the title working hard while Lachlan was doing Formula One cosplay in Australia. (laughs) (laughs) James threatens to quit. He halted discussions and after lunch, hopped on a flight to Indonesia. (laughs) While he was away, Lachlan and Rupert came up with a compromise. So all of 21st Century Fox's division would report to both of them. James would be the chief executive and Lachlan would share the more exalted title of co-chairman, which he would share with his father, right? 
Rupert's kind of stoking the competition at this point by two brothers by making them like co-equals, but still treating Lachlan like the heir apparent. This is from a New York Times, an incredible like four part series by the New York Times called Planet Fox. They say it's easy for a company senior executives to see which Murdoch which one Murdoch preferred. Murdoch's face would light up when Lachlan would roll his chair nearer to him at meetings, and they quickly learned which son to go to with their questions and requests. And Lachlan, Murdoch would ask, whenever executives told him that they had spoken to James about something. So basically he was like, I don't give a shit what James says. I want to hear what Lachlan says. And James and Lachlan don't get along either. From the same article, they say, As James saw it, his brother was mainly interested in the unique fringe benefits and trappings of power that came with the job. Lachlan, meanwhile, chafed at James's fixation on corporate governance, which he felt was inconsistent with the company's swashbuckling spirit. (laughs) So that this is where Lachlan starts to look more like Roman. He's interested in the power and the parties. And James is like, we actually need to uh, pay attention to corporate governance and shareholder value and all that stuff. Right. So at the same time, Fox is becoming more right wing. Rupert and Lachlan are down to clown with Tucker and Hannity. But James is more like, I don't want to say the word moderate because I honestly don't believe as a billionaire you can really be a moderate. Um, But he's becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the rhetoric. He's trying as hard as he can to be a stabilizing influence on his dad and brother. This kind of reminds me of like the Trump family dynamics with um, Ivanka and Trump. He tries to digitize the business and encourage Fox investment in modern companies. He's the one who championed 21st Century Fox investment in Vice Media. And remember that for later. This is basically the Volter equivalent. But, you know, he's hip. He's cool. It's very Kendall. James knows what's up. He knows that he's not going to be the one to take control from his dad and brother. And he has to find something else. What are we seeing, Adam? Bobby and Rupert. Rumu somewhere, somewhere uh, I don't know metropolitan. Where they are. It almost yeah. looks like Abu Dhabi or something like uh, that. I don't know. It uh, doesn't look like anywhere in America. Look, is that maybe London? European? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So Bob Iger and Rupert Murdoch very naturally touching each other's <laughs> on the shoulder. <laughs> no ties though. No ties. Very casual. So a few years later, James kind of finds his out. Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, signals that he's interested in buying 21st Century Fox. This is very similar to the Gojo deal. Okay, you're going to see a lot of similarities between this and the the, uh, fourth season of Succession. So the 21st Century Fox is a huge piece of News Corp. It's like two thirds of their revenue. Rupert wants to sell and he wants James out. So him and Lachlan can kind of like captain the pirate ship. Lachlan, on the other hand doesn't want to sell. He just came back from Australia to run this company and now it's going to be a third the size and it's just Fox News, which is like the lamest part of the empire. And James sees this as a way out. Um, He becomes really a champion of the deal. He knows that Bob is thinking about retiring and he thinks, could I be the CEO of Disney? (laughs) It's just like so funny. Like, babe, you couldn't even be the CEO of like a very small company. Like you're not going to be able to hack it. I'm so sorry, honey. Um, There's rumors during negotiations that he tries to tell Iger that the deal would not go through. It would be contingent upon him being named as the CEO. But Iger called Rupert and was like, is this true? And Rupert's like, no, (laughs) it's fucked up. So just as things are heating up on the negotiating table, daddy takes a tumble. So corporate gossip, piece of corporate gossip number five, the Disney cruise from hell. So we meet up again with the Murdoch family in New Year's 2018. This is the the vignette you heard at the beginning of the episode. Rupert and Jerry are on Lachlan's yacht in the Caribbean. He's up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom when he chips, trips down the stairs and breaks his back. What's funny about a lot of the headlines around this time and even in internal company memos after the accident say they broke his back because of a sailing accident. Like when you think of somebody breaking their back of a sailing accident, you're thinking like rigging some type of sail or something like that. He just fell on his way to the pisser. But that accident is just far too pedestrian for this family. So all the siblings show up to the UCLA Medical Center. They're with their dad for what might be their final days. And Murdoch later joked that he did not realize how serious his condition was until he had seen all his children gathered around his hospital bed. 
And this is what plays out really in the pilot of Succession. Mm -hmm. And everybody's ready for Murdoch to die, but he doesn't. And spoiler alert, he's still alive to this day. In the following months after this accident, he's trying to manage the business from bed. Although a lot of people are really questioning like his physical and mental capacity. But over this time, the Disney deal does go through. They buy 21st Century Fox for $71 billion. Rupert makes $4 billion. All the kids make $2 billion. James and Lachlan get an extra $20 million in Disney stock and a $70 million golden parachutes from 21st Century because they were working there right. at the time. Lachlan is now the CEO of Fox and right away follows in his dad's footsteps, using power and influence to promote right-wing candidates who will loosen regulations on his little kingdom, starting with Trump and Australian right-wing nationalist Scott Morrison. So ready for corporate gossip number six? Yeah. Oh, look at Lachlan and daddy. He looks so proud. He doesn't look like the founder of a massive media conglomerate. No. He, he, look, he, looks like a, he looks like a small town prison guard. <laughs> <laughs> so the piece of corporate gossip number six is the daddy issues to right wing radical pipeline claims Lachlan Murdoch. So it's 2019. We got Lachlan at the helm of Fox News and Trump is in the White House. And the line between these two entities is becoming increasingly blurry. Fox News is getting more brazen as they court the far right. Yeah, but prior to this, Lachlan really didn't have a ton of experience running Fox News. He was essentially just managing Roger Ailes, and Roger Ailes looked at mm. Lachlan as a joke and was like, fuck you, kid. I make the money. I make the decisions. Right. And they had a bunch of back and forth. So eventually when Roger Ailes was ousted for being a predator, Lachlan was like waiting in the arms to take over Fox and make the decisions. So this Trump in the White House thing is like his first like success. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because ratings, they're, they're, uh, this is not a hot take. During the Trump years, ratings of Fox, you know, from this is from 2015 to 2019, just go through the roof. And Fox really becomes this cultural zeitgeist that it is today. Meanwhile, James has had enough of the family business, right? He's out of the business. Him and Lachlan are not on speaking terms. He starts his own, doing his own thing. He's investing in technology startups with his Disney money. He takes a small stake in Vice Media. And this is the one that he had championed his dad to take a stake in six years prior. I don't think that that deal ended up going through. But again, this is like that Volter storyline. But there's a point where he really just wants to cut ties and sell his shares, but he's stuck because in the agreement that he has through the, through the trust, he can't sell his shares to outsiders. So he either has to sell them to his siblings or that's it or hold on to them. Mm. He tries to sell his shares to Lachlan and he even gets Elizabeth and Prudence on board. They all want out and their dad was down. He wanted James out too. He's like, this guy is a, you know, a, Craw in my what is that stick in my craw? Well, not only that, he doesn't agree with the family politics. I mean, right. he, in two, twenty, he in twenty twenty, he did like a hundred million dollars in political donations. Oh, James did right. James, but I'm yeah. saying like their dad wants James out because he doesn't like how you know he's he probably believes in climate him, change. Right, right. He's probably calling James a bleeding heart liberal, and yeah. it's like I don't want this his his energy around me. His Clinton energy, right. Ultimately, though, Lachlan declined the offer. And he said at the time it just wasn't financially feasible, but it kind of makes me wonder whether A, he doesn't think he can do it alone, or B, did he want to stay bonding to his siblings in this way so they could like hang out at board meetings? Mm -hmm. And like, this is the only family dynamic. Silicon he knows. Va go to Silicon Valley or <laughs> go to Squab, go to Sun Valley. Sun Valley together, yeah. Right. So he can always count on a quarterly call to see his brother. <laughs> Seriously. Hey, I'll see you in the next earnings yeah. call. So in March 2019, Fox News becomes a public company. Lachlan is chairman, CEO, and Murdoch is co-chairman. Less than two years later, Lachlan and Rupert face the biggest ever threat to their shrinking empire. The next piece of corporate gossip is in Rupert's 92nd year, he might, in the words of James Kennedy, get a spank bottom <laughs> in the form of a defamation lawsuit by Dominion Voting Systems. I'm going to get sent for a timeout. <laughs> Andy, Andy. Andy's going to spank my bottom. <laughs> Aren't you, Andy? So the theme throughout Your this... worm in a tuxedo. Rupert Murdoch really is. Imagine, guys, 
I'm sorry, but imagine if we had half the energy we have for Scandaval for Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> They'd he'd be over in no time. I mean, believe me, I've been on the Scandaval, but like the whole point of this co podcast is to just take a little bit of that energy and put it towards these guys. So the theme throughout the story is that Rupert Murdoch is facing little or no consequences to his bad behavior. The bribes, the politicians, he lies on the stand, he throws his kids under the bus, and now he's facing real consequences. So here's what happened very briefly. Take yourself back to 2020, and Fox is the first news outlet to call Arizona for Biden. Again, you'll see a lot of this play out in the final season of Succession. But they call Arizona for Biden, basically declaring the race over. Fox viewers are pissed because at this point, they have been sitting there watching this network for four years being told exactly what they want to hear. And Rupert and Lachlan are doing that on purpose, right, for the ratings. And, and now their decision desk has made a call and Fox viewers are pissed. And so Fox hosts, to make them feel better, start peddling these half-baked conspiracy theories about the election being stolen from Republicans. One of these theories in particular is around the companies that make voting machines. I don't know the exact, I don't. you might remember better than I, the exact conspiracy theory, but something about Trump votes being sent to China via satellite and being counted as Biden votes, whatever. One of the companies that makes these voting machines is Dominion Voting Machines. They sue Fox for $1.6 billion for defamation. And again, defamation cases are notoriously so hard to prove. But the amount of evidence that Fox News has on Fox News correspondents and execs knowingly lying to their viewers about Dominion. Eventually, Fox suit settled for $788 million avoiding a trial that was not looking like it was going to go their way and it would expose even dirtier secrets. This was the largest defamation settlement ever. Massive blow to Rupert and his family. This guy never admits defeat. And there's another bigger voting machine lawsuit on the horizon. Smartmatic is seeking $2.7 billion and that hasn't even gone to court yet. Yeah, what would have been great is if it went to trial, because then like Tucker and Hannity and all these guys, and, like, you know, the producers who you don't see, they have to get on the stand, right, and talk about, well, their email communications being like, oh, so you knew this wasn't true and you still said it. Well, you know, like backpedaling and playing that game. Well, the crazy part to me is it's like, these are the scandals that we've just covered, eight pieces of corporate gossip, the scandals around Rupert Murdoch that have hit the press imagine what they would have found in discovery of the things that hadn't hit the right. press you know well i don't think anyone was under the impression that like fox news or news corp was like a fantastic place to work <laughs> i mean yeah seriously okay you ready for the next piece of corporate gossip actually the last the piece. last piece so where does the family stand today so nothing like people reaching their early 60s and never really addressing their childhood traumas so let's start with rupert go to the next slide <laughs> what you're seeing here is Rupert's Twitter picture. And I, this is really representative of where he's at mentally. Um, he, he's losing it, right? He briefly proposed to and called off an engagement with the QAnon supporter who said that Tucker Carlson was a messenger from God. He had this weird plan to merge Fox and News Corp, but the shareholders completely rejected it. They called it a harebrained scheme. They got their ass handed to them by investors, said a person close to the Murdochs. And honestly, his empire is crumbling and his power is fleeting. Like, look at this guy. He's not hes not really, you know, doing massive deals on his PJ anymore. More like in his PJs. So where he was once a kingmaker, now his favorite presidential candidate, Ron DeSantis, is announcing his candidacy via Twitter dial-up. <laughs> Go to the next one. Elizabeth is still close with Rupert and Lachlan. You know, she's sitting with a, in a box with them at the Super Bowl. A person close to Elizabeth says she wants to enjoy the time she has left with her father. She is terrified of Rupert dying mad at her. And it's crazy. It's like, what could she have done to make him mad? But like, sh he'll, he just hangs these things over his head yeah. because he's manipulative and abusive. Side note, you can see his um, dyed hair in this picture. Oh, yeah, I see it very <laughs> well now. Thank you. Very natural. Okay, go ahead to the next picture. Here's Lachlan. 
he's doubling down on his ability to lead Fox News, even though it just reported a 50 million loss for the last quarter compared to a 300 million dollar well, profit. Also, Fox, the all of Fox, like he announced that they were signing Tom Brady for for um, for the football coverage. He's he's done a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of that stuff in recent recent years. What else has he done? Um, oh, he he's been discussing that Fox's strategy will not change exactly, even without Tucker. Um, and then he's speaking to the defamation uh, suits. One thing as a football watcher that I think people should be aware of, and I didn't know this until I did a little bit more research, but um, when you're watching football on a Sunday or like any Fox coverage, they are like slamming you with live betting. And the reason is Fox has 18% ownership of FanDuel. I had no idea. Yeah, which seems like a conflict it of does. interest, right? Yeah. But um, so, yeah, that's really interesting. I think Lachlan... That was a pretty pretty savvy move to get in on some of this gambling. Yeah. I mean, he's always been, like, really into the digital stuff, right? right? So, by the way, I should note that that loss that Fox News suffered was a result of the Dominion lawsuit. Um, but still, I mean, many people say he's running the company out of duty to his dad, and he just doesn't really want to do it, but he kind of has to, which is like— God, I love a CEO who's just like, God, I guess I'll do this if my dad well, wants me I to. Mean, I mean, I wonder 30 years ago if he could have seen like, fuck, I really don't want to be doing this. Like, this is his dream. And now he's there and he's like, uh, I'm kind of over it. Yeah. It's like, guys, oh, my God. The whole point of being a Nepo baby is you don't have to work. So stop. Yeah. God, so annoying. Anyway, James, next picture. Oh. Look at him. This was from a profile of him on the New York Times. He's waiting in the wings. Allegedly, after Rupert dies, he, Elizabeth, and Prudence are planning to take control of the company from Lachlan via their uh, shares. Quote, James sees destroying Fox News as his mission in life, said a senior Fox staffer. And him and Rupert are just not on speaking terms right now. Rupert got word to James that it would mean a lot if James attended his 90th birthday, but he didn't go. And Lachlan told Rupert that James was the one leaking stories to the writers of Succession. And James denies watching the show, but... Bullshit, yeah. I mean, James... <laughs> I, I, James now is like completely flipped the script, right? From like 10 years ago, where now he's like a climate activist. Yeah. Well, married to a climate activist. Climate activist since I was right. Big time Democratic um, donor. He's like, he's like just being like, you know what? Fuck you, dad. He doesn't double even, wielding, double yeah. wielding middle fingers to his father. He doesn't even look like the same guy that was sitting at the parliamentary here. No, he dad. doesn't. He, he looks, looks completely different. You know what? He kind of, he looks happy. He looks lighter. I think once these kids kind of like Elizabeth and him right now, and maybe Prudence a little bit, and you saw this in succession with Connor, like he didn't have the issues that the other kids have because he was never in the running for success. Or to lead the empire. So when you don't have that hanging yeah, over but your Con shoulder. Yeah, but Connor's wielding like other things, right? He's like, I oh, know. I want to be, I want power, but in a different way. In a way. different way, I know. But when you don't have that hanging over your head, it's like how the power dynamic changes if you tell your boss, you know, you're not interested in a promotion, right? right. When they, when people don't have something to hang over your head, it, it creates a sense of freedom and lightness. And I, I do see that in James. He feels a little lighter. The, here's the question, though. Regardless of who succeeds, who takes over this company, can any of them actually do it? In succession, there's that scene at the karaoke lounge where Logan says that the Roy siblings are not serious people. You know, despite how close they are to power, they lack the things that made their father so successful. And in this New York Times interview where this picture is from, James is asked whether his success can attribute, be attributed to hard work, not luck. This is how he answered. Isn't that what they say? The harder you work, the luckier you get. I'm like, I've never heard that quote. Is that what they say? I don't think that's how it works. So anyway, you ready for the takeaways? Yeah, let's go. Here are the takeaways. So. I mean, obviously, we don't know any of the Murdochs personally. And are we really the type to psychoanalyze people from afar? Yeah, for yes. sure. <laughs> Without With a no doubt. degrees. <laughs> so wow. let's do it. We have proxy degrees from our, from our mother. So. That's true. Our moms are therapists. So we are Nepo babies. Yeah. <laughs> and we get to do therapy on anybody we want right now live. Are you ready? So here's a, a really good article I read called... Uh, a therapist breaks down the Roy family's daddy issues from the LA Times. And here are like the big themes. So a big theme 
she, this therapist says, is watching them continually try to placate dad, who uses financial abuse every step of the way, hoping that one day they're going to be the favorite. This plays out in the battle to be named successor, but it's really, I want to be loved by this man. And no matter what they do, it never works. There's this theme of being good enough. This applies to Lachlan and James. You know, they go back and forth between being golden child, but they're constantly being beat down by dad. So this trauma is I'm not good enough and I never know what to expect. I constantly have to fight to show that I'm still the man, even though I'm disintegrating inside. Um, then you have Elizabeth, daddy's girls, daddy's girl. If you think of flight, fight or freeze or fawn, she says, I see Shiv mostly ut utilizing fawn with her dad. She tries to connect with him by making herself the daddy's girl. And it's interesting because I don't see her navigating the world with anybody else as a fawn. With her siblings, she can be fairly cutthroat. She can say hurtful things. She fawns them in more manipulative ways to get her needs met. And then, of course, you have Rupert and Logan, the narcissist. Um, and she says, you know, he might have some sort of narcissistic personality disorder. And she says he's so abusive that he can't let any of them do anything else with their lives. Like how many times did Elizabeth try to go to Stanford and he roped her back in? James tried to do his own record right. label. He bought that. I think the saddest thing throughout the entire show, she says, is that none of them see themselves as separate from their dad. They only see themselves within the reflection of him. If he thinks they're great and powerful, they believe it. If he thinks they are losers, they believe it. And then she goes on to say with it, when any of them realize they want out, he recognizes that if he use it, utilizes their need for them to bond with him in that moment, then they won't go. And he can continue to keep them imprisoned in this emotional and financial abuse. So look at James. He or, Sorry, Lachlan. He tried to leave. He tried to go to the other side of the world because he got in such a big fight with his dad. And Rupert's just like, I begged him to stay. I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. Like, let these kids get away from you, please. As soon as they receive the validation, she says, every piece of them that was trying to be differentiated dissolves and they immediately become enmeshed with him again. Yeah, it's like uh, any toxic relationship that it, anyone's ever been in. Seriously. It's like grooming. It's kind it, of grooming. It, you know what? If you go back, go back to that picture, Mike, towards the beginning of the kids when they were younger. I totally believe that these kids were set up to to accept this abusive behavior from their father. Yeah. Be interesting to hear the mother come out and kind of be like, God, you know, like this, what my kids were subjected to. Frank, like, yeah, I would like to, I would, oh, I would love a tell out by the mother. Yeah. Anyway, do you have any other takeaways from this? No, I, I, there was one part in the succession finale where, uh, you know, Roman, it's interesting uh, with Roman's character. Like you could just see how fucked up he is. Like he wants pain. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah, when Kendall's, that, like, ripping his Band-Aid off. Yeah, like, yeah. and he's like, oh, thanks, man. Like, I needed that. Like, he just, he needs pain. And, like, that wouldn't shock me if one of these kids is, is similar or has, like, some weird thing like that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's honestly this story, as much as, you know, it would be nice to be a Nepo baby, it also comes with a hefty amount of trauma that is just so apparent and these these in the documentary like nobody seemed particularly happy or fulfilled no james might be fulfilled now james seems happy now yeah yeah but he still has this huge weight over his shoulder yeah. like i i do believe these kids will be very relieved when when rupert dies shall we end the episode with a twinkie yes i don't think i've ever had a twinkie or it's been many many years i'm on a I diet have. You're on a diet? You yeah. just lost how many pounds with COVID, though? Yeah, well, that's what started the diet. Well, we both have to try it. The Jeff's Killing Special. Mm. How is it? Moist. Very, that's actually really good. I can see why Skilling would like that in the morning. All right. If you want to purchase us some Diet Coke and Twinkies, you can do so at the link in our show notes. And of course, you can find us on TikTok at Corporate Gossip Pod. I recently changed the name to the account. Um, or you can email us at Becca at nighttoast.com or Adam at nighttoast.com. Thanks again. And we'll be back with season three, like I said, later this summer or maybe a couple episodes in between. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Thanks, Adam, for being here with me. Thank you. And thank you, Mike. Woo.